So it's uh, my pleasure now uh, to, uh, to, to share this session. And as time goes by, the sad, the sad moment of our separation approaches. And never, nevertheless, I'm very pleased to, to share this session with a, uh, with a very, uh, very ex good uh, speakers that I am going to introduce now. The, the, the title of the session, as you can see, is how to align energy transition with climate, climate objectives. To do that, we have uh, identified uh, th three past presidents of the association, which will comment uh, an excellent speech, which, is, which will be delivered by, uh, by, by somebody that I will introduce later. Among the, the, presid the presidents we have selected, you have here the list of the four, my 40 predecessors. And, um, uh, three of them have been selected because they, are, uh, they were president at, at a very uh, important moment of the, uh, the history of, uh, of climate change uh, fight. The three identified one are André Plourde in the room, and we have also identified Peter Hardley and uh, Ricardo Reneri, successively uh, president um, in, of the association. And at the same moment, the uh, climate change uh, uh, assessments have been, uh, has been uh, addressed by the conference of parties, uh, of, uh, which are detailed on this page. And at this, so, um, uh, uh, which, um, excuse me, this is the first one is uh, yeah. André, André Plourde was president during the Bali conference. Uh, uh, Ricardo Reneri was, uh, no, Peter Hardley was president during the Paris conference, and Ricardo Reneri was president uh, two years ago. And uh, th so th I will take the opportunity of their presidency to have the, their, their opinion of what, uh, what happened at that time. But the first speaker I would like to introduce is, is a, a very br brilliant speaker, which is uh, John Wyant. John Wyant is a professor of management, sci management science and engineering and the director of um, the Energy Modeling Forum at Stanford University. Uh, John, you have been a, a very, uh, very uh, powerful uh, author at the IPCC, the Inter International Panel on Climate Change, and you have uh, received a lot of uh, several awards, that I, I cannot uh, name all of them now, for your contribution to, climate ch uh, to, to fight the fight against climate change. So, John, uh, I will give you the floor, and uh, look, we are looking for, for your uh, view on this, on this topic. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and esteemed uh, panelists. Uh, I'm glad so many of you uh, were able to stay at the very, uh, very end. Um, um, I'd also like to thank the organizing committee, uh, in particular, um, Pierre Olivier Panot, uh, as I mentioned to him earlier today, I jumped in the cab yesterday and the cab driver said, what's up over there, you know, what were you doing? And I described the meeting in the IAE and he said, Professor Panot. And I said, what? Uh, and then I started explaining, uh, as I often do, exactly what the uh, role of uh, Professor Panot was as the co-organizer and the president of the Canadian uh, IAE. And I said, uh, but do you know him? And he said, uh, only by reputation. He's very big in, uh, in social media here. So I was very impressed, very impressed by that. Um, I would like to say a couple of preliminaries. I've actually been to um, Montreal a few times before. Uh, one notable thing, which actually ties into the talk nicely, is I was here in 1995 uh, for the final plenary of IPCC 2. We're now on six and it was actually the eve of the vote on Quebec uh, accession from Canada, and it made me really appreciate Canadian politics because it was very cordial, people were very friendly. It was a little bit like the Mardi Gras, and uh, of course the decision was a very close one as some of uh, people have recounted uh, since I got here, so that was a memorable th thing. And on the IAE side, uh, Jim Sweeney and I from Stanford were involved uh, very actively in the early days, particularly in organizing meetings. And one thing I was uh, able to do with a lot of help from uh, a lot of friends was organize a international meeting in the United States in San Francisco. This was 1984. So by my calculation, that was probably something like the seventh uh, international meeting. 
And I know how much work it is, and I was very impressed by how much bigger and better this one uh, was in uh, uh, recognizing all the work uh, put into it. So uh, back to our uh, main topic today, um, my answer to this question uh, is going to be, um, just in case you miss it as I go through the technical details, is uh, the way to align energy transitions with climate objectives is very carefully and with great humility. Uh, I do worry that the uh, uh, international scientific community uh, sometimes gets out in front of the actual science in various ways and the media uh, kind of uh, pushes that kind of one level uh, beyond that. So much of my short talk here today will be uh, not on what to do, but what to look out for and what not to do, uh, more than uh, advice on what to do. So the three main questions I wanted to discuss briefly, uh, two of them are kind of preliminary to the main event, which has been really well covered in many of the parallel and uh, plenary sessions I've seen. The last one, how should we do it, is uh, what should our climate objectives be in the first place and what role should energy sector transitions play in achieving these goals that sometimes seems in groups like this and in, pub in, in public discourse that it's all about the energy se uh, sector and obviously the energy sector has a huge role to play in it and is affected by changes in climate itself and there's lots of research going on uh, about that but it's not the only game in town so I do worry uh, that people are think they're, think, uh, may think that a problem has been solved and they work very hard to do that and then find that it's only a small part of the ultimate uh, solution. Uh, now, the other uh, constraint, I actually was going to make additional topics, but that was too many. Uh, but things to keep in mind is um, we need, as several uh, speakers have said in the previous plenaries, really, really realistically taking institutional barriers into account. We like carbon taxes, but sometimes uh, cap and trade works better. And I will argue even regulatory uh, approaches um, uh, are much more feasible. Certainly in California, we find that is often the case. Uh, secondly, uh, there is a massive communication problem we struggle with in all the disciplines that contribute to the IPCC um, and other uh, uh, the deliberative bodies, including the Conference of Parties uh, itself. And in doing this work, because of the nature of the climate problem, uh, we need to look out over a very complex, highly uncertain long run future. So it could be considered, another uh, tagline on this talk could be considered to be, it's all about the uncertainty, stupid. Uh, but of course, I wouldn't call any of you stupid. This is kind of on, on, on me and uh, primarily. So the first question I'm going to ask is, what should our climate objectives be? Uh, should they be limited to the climate system and its direct consequences or put in a broader framework? A lot of nice talks about this in plenaries and in uh, parallel sessions. Should it uh, factor in, at this point, sustainability, including environmental inequity d dimensions? Obviously, the easiest thing to do is local air pollution in terms of tying things in with uh, uh, in uh, income distribution and uh, distributional effects in general uh, right behind that, but less well analyzed in most jurisdictions so far. Uh, and if the focus is going to be primarily on the climate system or the climate system as an important element in the sustainable development framework. Uh, actually did IPCC three chapter on, believe it or not, uh, sustainable development and international equity. Uh, that was a hard job at that point. I predict it, uh, it still is. Uh, what climate metrics should they be on? CO2? or greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 or greenhouse gas concentrations, radi this arcane uh, climate science term, radiative forcing, or temperature change. And there's a lot of uh, loose talk about uh, goals and objectives for all those metrics, and I'm not sure it's really understood uh, by the readers, and sometimes I'm not really sure it's understood by the writers of those uh, particularly the news stories, but also at times the scientific communities involved because there are a lot of them and it isn't clear that all the details have been working out and in particular in line with the inner, uh, inner, uh, inner scientific uh, 
uh, Academy's report of seven years ago, uh, it's not clear any of the working groups in the IPCC uh, have been able to successfully characterize the uncertainties underlying their scientific results, nor communicated to decision makers how they ought to use that information. So that will be a theme. Uh, the next question is, should they be geographically differentiated in metrics or levels? I think that is the world that we're now in, and we're m working more bottom-up. Pleasingly, in this conference, we've seen several excellent talks about how to bring things back together and make sure they're at least mutually reinforcing and somewhat calibrated as opposed to totally disjoint from each other. Um, and uh, the final question, particularly in light of last year's Nobel Prize in Economics and our good friend Bill Nordhaus, uh, should we set climate targets using cost-benefit analysis or a modified version of uh, cost-benefit analysis that uh, includes a broader sense, uh, uh, set of information, not only on the sustainability side, but regarding the robustness, resilience, and sustainability of the solutions within the energy sector itself. So what are the stakes? This is from the uh, last fall's uh, IPCC 1.5 degree report on the desirability and necessity of going for 1.5 degrees. I was actually a co-inventor of this diagram in the third assessment report, uh, which I call the flaming embers diagram. It is officially known as the burning embers <laughs> diagram. Uh, take, take that as you will. So it has uh, five causes for concern. This actually started because number four there uh, was actually the aggregate economic uh, cost benefit damage function perspective. And at that point, it looked like the existing studies on climate change impacts, mostly based on developed country ag agriculture impacts, uh, actually had a net positive uh, welfare payoff for two or two and a half degrees C relative to free industrial, which did seem strange to a lot of people who are living and working in individual countries and sectors otherwise represented in that report. So the resolution of that was to create this diagram, which is causes for concern across many things that policymakers need to take into account. R, R3 is distributional impact. So that says, oh guys, since you actually do these calculations and weight people only by the marketed income that they produce, that seems to some people a little bit unfair internationally. I'm sure you're all aware of the measurement difficulties and equity concerns there. Why not look at the number of people affected as opposed to the uh, only the impact on the value of economics. So those are the only two economic-based uh, causes for concern that are considered then and now. Uh, the left-hand side is unique and threatened systems, which usually uh, means coral reefs and um, birds and butterfly type things. But it occurred to me in rereading this for the 25th time that it also has to include low-lying island nations. So if you lose your whole society, to sea level rise, that's probably a bad thing, and we're already starting to see some of that going on. This is pure physical science, is, as is bar two, which says our extreme weather uh, events getting worse. I'll talk about this a little bit later. They are getting worse uh, in terms of physical impacts, uh, amount of rainfall, and possibly winds, although not totally uh, diagnosed as such. Uh, the amount of damage, though, is largely influenced by uh, migration patterns and insurance markets and so on. So the attribution of extreme weather event damages, as opposed to physical changes, uh, is really a complicated um, attribution problem. And there's probably as much that's come from the spread of humanity and population and everybody wanted to live on a, a nice vista at the ocean or right on the border of a national uh, national or state forest in our case, which is interesting. So this is really what is put forward to the stakes. This diagram, by the way, uh, has kind of no impacts in white, medium impacts or moderate impacts in yellow, and then high and very high. And this was kind of darkened up in the 1.5 report, even compared to the last full IPCC assessment in 2014. And uh, it is based on a subjective ass assessment of a uh, interesting and notional uh, emerging literature, but there's no real uh, 
more structuring of it than that. So it's an expert opinion across the number of qualitative and qualitative, quantitative studies in the different regions of the world. So pleasingly for us analyst types, which I think is most IAEE IA, IA, IA members, uh, the uh, fifth assessment report, work group two, the sequel actually to the chapter that we did the burning embers diagram in is a synthesis tool, actually says you must put uh, these impacts in a risk framework and look at, just as I indicated in the case of the storms and so on, uh, put them in an integrated risk framework where you look at how exposed a society is, possibly because they do things outside or in low water, uh, on, on the one hand, their ability to adapt on the other hand, and then overlay the climate exposure on top of that, which gives you some measure of vulnerability. Uh, and in that, you need to, another word that was invented in the IPCC, you need to consider adaptive capacity. So that means, are the people trained enough uh, uh, do they have enough resources and infrastructure to adapt? And the answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no. The hardest thing about getting those transition points in the, uh, particularly the physical um, uh, uh, causes for concern is adaptation. So we don't really know how to do that very well. And as I mentioned before, maybe the adaptation is not to let, uh, for our Houston friend, not to let poor people move into known flood zones in between big major rain events, which were made slightly worse by Harvey, but would have been bad enough even by in the historical uh, uh, record. Um, so just to show that we should uh, and could focus in on these extremely vulnerable uh, areas that have limited uh, adaptive capacity, as we see on cable news uh, in nightly now, and we're now just starting today, the hurricane season for 2019, we had three big storms, um, Harvey and Houston, Michael up through the gut of the US, uh, spun up in the Caribbean atypically, and Maria, which devastated uh, uh, Puerto Rico and a few other places. In California side, we have these California wildfires, the Thomas, the two biggest ones the last two years have been Thomas in 2017 in Santa Barbara, and the Camp Fire in Northern California. Uh, both of the, neither of these were actually caused by climate change as an ignition event. They were probably, they burned faster and more furiously because it was a bit drier. There's been some good studies on that. Uh, but the fact is more people are moving into these areas, making them more vulnerable. And uh, excuse the technical word, I always get criticized for this. People spaz out more and forget to turn out uh, uh, douse uh, campfires or in some cases throw fireworks into dry, uh, dry forest, and in Northern California, almost every single fire we've seen, 18 in the last two years, have been caused by downed power lines, either on PG&E's property or private property, it turns out. So how do we think about this in the aggregate when we put everything together? One way to do this, as a macro person at heart, you try to do as much with macro, and then you've got to go micro to actually understand the strengths and limitations of the macro approach. This is a, um, a diagram that I severely criticized when it came out by a couple of uh, top researchers at the Potsdam Institute. So all this shows is the translation from CO2 equivalent greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to temperature change. But it's got uh, cumulative distribution functions that are estimated by climate scientists using usually Monte Carlo a simulation through the guts of their climate models. You'll see quite a wide range then, and this is still the case today. So what it shows is for the most optimistic and less optimistic model, what are the odds of going over two degrees C if your CO2 uh, equivalent of concentration level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is say 450, if it's 450, this says here, you've got about a 50, 50 chance for the average model of exceeding two degrees C eventually, and that for some of the extreme members of that ensemble, if I could call it that, goes up to 75% or as low as 25%. So you may see in various news reporting that the science is all known and it's easy to translate whatever the emissions are to concentrations to radiative forcing to temperature change, but it's simply not true. So this is not to say that working with a mean number isn't a good way to start the calculation, but I would argue if you're concerned about risk assessment and risk management, it's a poor place to start. Moreover, uh, this is actually much more complicated than this simple diagram might indicate. What are these? These are equilibrium calculations. So if the uh, 
I'll amend what I said previously. If the concentration in CO2 equivalents of all greenhouse gases, not just carbon, is 450, the average climate model ensemble, probabilistically, says you have a 50 50-50 uh, chance of exceeding the two degrees C target. If you actually look at current levels and try to sync this up and look at the dynamics from where we are today to long run equilibrium, there are two confounding factors. So you can see in the newspapers every day that the, the, uh, the Mauna Loa record as of last Sunday says 14, uh, 414 parts per million CO2. Uh, these calculations here are actually done on total CO2 uh, concentrate, sorry, total greenhouse gas concentrations, which include methane and, uh, and uh, uh, nitrous oxide, as well as the fluorinated gases. I'll show in a minute how big a deal that is relative to just considering CO2. So that means we're locked into a, a higher uh, number. So to keep it 450 there, you're actually, um, you have a much higher probability of going over. Now, why aren't people immediately concerned about that? Uh, and that's for two reasons. Uh, one is uh, there are these short-run climate forcers, namely air pollutants, that come out the same time the greenhouse gases do, black and organic carbon, which are local air pollution. So the fact is right now we go uh, down about 38 uh, parts per million because we have these air pollutants actually sheltering the Earth's surface from receiving the, uh, the heat from up above. So there are two dynamic issues here. One is the translation between what the climate, uh, what the temperature signature is so far and what we will ultimately get from the stock of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So that makes things worse, possibly a lot worse if you're trying to go for a very low target. On the other side, uh, the aerosols you could view as providing headroom, but that's kind of a dire way to say, if you keep air pollution in Beijing, we're gonna thank you because you're gonna keep the Earth's surface heating a little bit less, more, less fast than it would otherwise. So I'll leave it to the international negotiators to uh, sort that out. It's just a thing that actually exists and we should not forget about it. Um, so two things about that. One is I have these numbers constructed here. And it's also important to know in terms of the sensitivity uh, how delicate the Earth's e energy balance is. Uh, a colleague of mine who's a climate scientist said it's kind of like saying that your temperature might go from 98.6 degree normal up 2 degrees C. Think about that. Here, because the actual balance of the Earth's uh, energy fluxes is 342 watts per meter squared at the top of the atmosphere, at the surface you're now absorbing about 492. With no greenhouse gases, the surface of the Earth on average would be minus, 17, minus 13 degrees centigrade, it's calculated, and we actually have a pre-industrial level of about plus 17 degrees. So it's useful to have some greenhouse gases. The problem is we're now increasing that, but only very gradually. So the best estimate of how much forcing has been increased is about two watts per meter squared, which you might think would go to 1.5 degrees. If you look at the current increase relative to pre-industrial, it's only one, and the reason is the ocean dynamics where the heat comes into the atmosphere and is slowly absorbed into the ocean, and the equilibrium is not reached for on the order of 100 degrees, as this heat goes deeper and deeper into the ocean, it heats it up. Once the heat capacity of the deep ocean is completely filled up, then the atmosphere increases back up. So the equilibrium can take a long time. So both this, how can we factor in the aerosols shielding and the lag in the climate, uh, uh, the response of the climate system should be cause for concern. Here we see an IPCC 5 summary report, kind of an interesting diagram where, again, they have a little bit more yellow version of the causes for concern, uh, but also uh, they have greenhouse gas uh, concentrations on the bottom and then carbon emissions on the top. So obviously they're putting a lot of additional information about short-lived climate forces and the role of other greenhouse gases. So uh, I'll talk about the other greenhouse gases now. Uh, so here, in addition to other greenhouse gases, we have to look at the role of the land sector, which actually produces a lot of carbon that isn't directly related to energy production and use. And then when we go to the uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, um, and how it affects radiative forcing, 
uh, we have the opportunity to uh, manipulate short-lived climate forces I already mentioned. Also, uh, 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 climate emissions management or direct air capture, as it's sometimes called, and geoengineering. Those are actually tools in the toolkit. And if we get too far behind and realize we blew the risk assessment, we uh, might have to do that. So we do need to consider the relationship between radiative forcing and temperature changes I just tried to sketch out. Now, in terms of actual emissions, about 65% of total greenhouse gas, uh, gas forcing uh, comes from carbon dioxide, another 11% from land uh, carbon dioxide. You may know that a little bit of the methane emissions comes from the energy sector through gas leaks. But on the other hand, in here we have carbon dioxide that's actually both from fossil fuel combustion and industrial process use, like cement, iron, and steel, and aluminum. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind for most of us, but not all, is uh, the small role of the United States now and other developed countries in the total uh, world uh, emissions. We now have China producing about 30% of the total greenhouse gas loading each year, and the U.S. is down to 15 and dropping fast. You can see the other countries there. So somehow this has to sync up. You can't say we reduced our emissions in our jurisdiction by 80% by 2050, and magically, because somebody did a rough calculation 20 years ago or even last week with a one model, uh, that that's going to actually solve the problem. So the, pick, the, the word here is to uh, try to get enough into the science that you'll actually understand what people are telling you needs to be done uh, in looking at the uh, carbon emission things. I'll go quicker now. So here, this is kind of a review of the many model comparison studies that we've done that have been done around at the Energy Modeling Forum that have been done around the world and by many of you in this hall uh, here today who have uh, talked on some of your results. So the questions uh, that I would have on how we should cause or allow these to occur is what policy instruments should we use? Should it be direct price and, uh, quantity controls and regulatory action? Should it be R&D and other programs to stimulate energy innovation? That's been very helpful. I was a space program guy 35 years ago. Uh, solar was $1,000 a watt by 2000. It was $12 a watt, and now it's one, depending on uh, where you are. It's important to realize those numbers are very location specific and not forget that. It's easy to say, well, we'll use Arizona for solar and uh, North Dakota for wind. I think that leads to sometimes some pretty misleading results. The other thing we can do is uh, been, I think, pretty successful uh, in the energy efficiency side is information programs and try to um, provide behavioral wedges to promote efficiency. Uh, as my colleague Jim Sweeney has said, these need not be worked through the price system. So in economics, we now have behavioral economics as a thing. 20 years ago, all the economists said behavior is second order and doesn't really matter in these, uh, in these kinds of uh, situations. I would say as uh, Jim Center demonstrated, the improvements in not just the social psychology, but the ability to provide information um, rapidly at a fine enough scale, temporarily and uh, distributionally has been very helpful. So we now turn uh, to insights from this uh, experience from many model comparisons. I think one critique I have of our community as well as the climate science and the biology impacts community is there seems to be a lot of interesting research and a lot of interesting questions come up, but no overarching strategy. So I'm always worried for me personally, guilty. We do you know, 20 models, 30 scenarios, and we think we've done a big swath of the relevant state space. That was our response to the inner academy critique. And that's good, but it's just a start. If you're really serious about solving the problem and the risk management, uh, that you need to do, regardless of what the temperature and uh, other atmospheric conditions uh, wind up being, um, I think we really could benefit from a more strategic thing. If you're into decision theory, something that's a little bit akin to the value of information would be quite useful. Uh, for this group, I won't spend much on time on this. This is a very simple process analysis energy model. You can put welfare economic uh, supply and demand curves on the two ends of this spectrum, you can do a simple Markel model and uh, minimize energy system cost, including any welfare loss because of, uh, you know, putting a tax on and creating a difference between the producer price and the market equal, previous market equilibrium and the same thing on the demand side. You can do that and you have to obey the rules of thermodynamics and not create energy out of nothing as some people have uh, sometimes accidentally or on purpose done.
Uh, extensions to the simple model, in my mind, it's pretty easy to go from the simple processor model uh, on the energy system to a computable general equilibrium model and just put different processes in. I would say engineers think about process analysis and discrete technologies. Economists usually think of production, cost functions, and the like. But conceptually, if you have the data and the will to do it, you can actually do it. Lots been learned about how to uh, make those models better. Uh, you can actually make optimization and simulation models equivalent to each other, going way back to an old Samuelson uh, paper. You can consider multiple time periods and dynamics. You can, uh, ex as I said, extend to the whole economy, do multiple agents and multiple regions, and you can actually do similar type process modeling and sync it in to represent other scarce resources like agricultural land, forestry, water, and so on. Um, what we've learned from the model comparison projects, this is based on a, I now decided I was right in 2000, I did a paper, uh, urgent paper for the Peace Center, I, I meaning the modeling community as a whole, uh, and said, what, why, have, why are there so many differences in the cost estimates for mitigating climate change? And uh, I looked at the literature and uh, then, and still with only modern modifications, said there are five major determinants. One is, um, what is the policy target? There are people trying to do standardized comparisons and using, you know, two degrees C, five degrees C, four degrees C, 450 ppm, uh, uh, you know, 2.6 watts per meter squared, 8.5 watts per meter squared, and they're all kind of all thrown together. Uh, the other thing that really struck me, and uh, I'll come back to it in a second in a policy context, international and domestic policy architectures, the mix of policy um, uh, instruments. Many of the talks here have talked about, you could do it with non-price uh, oriented signals, um, uh, particularly the, uh, trying to influence the markets, uh, but it, um, it might cost you more doing that way. So you might be able to achieve the same objective. We did, actually did a study on this in the US, which I'll talk about at the end. Uh, so that's external. I, my reckoning is that explains at least half of the difference right there. Just how do you implement it? I keep getting asked by Congress people and Nicholas Stern, uh, can I verify that hitting any concentration target will cost no more than 1% discounted present value GDP? And I said, uh, I ain't answering that question. Uh, if you tell me how you're going to do it, and you policymakers, congressmen hate this talk, uh, if you tell me how you're going to do it, and it's not going to all go into collecting revenues for pork barrel projects in your district, then you swear that you're not going to do that, I can do a better job of it uh, than not. So Nick wanted to say 1%. I said the actual results, even with only cursory, non-efficient uh, policies, will give you 1% to 5 or 6%. And I can easily argue that 10% is not unusual. So I actually wrote an article right after this time that said two orders of magnitude pervade the cost estimates. We could get lucky on technology and a breakthrough could occur and it could be a tenth of a percent of uh, tenth of one percent of GDP. If we're unlucky and do very inefficient policies, it could be ten percent or more. And I still believe that's that's the truth. Uh, so I think that's important. One that's been really was hard to do initially and now it's harder is partially internal, partially external. So that's what are you going to use for the baseline? Uh, given that people have policies that are climate policies at a regional level or not, and they also have other policies that affect climate outcomes. And then finally for this group, totally uh, well known, the two things that the models do in the aggregate to adjust to changing relative prices are economic substitution through changing processes or movements along a production or cost curve and technological change, which is probably the hardest thing to do, but the most important thing to do. So when climate modelers say, why don't you do a hindcast and go back to 1900 and run your energy models? I say, yeah, we could do that, but I'll tell you the first thing uh, is we do very badly projecting economic output and composition. Uh, and even if you give us that and we can use the actual numbers, we're really shitty at predicting technology and technology change. And not that we couldn't do better, uh, but we should try to do better and maybe do a probabilistic uh, uh, projection, projections. So the first four results of my review of the literature is we need to be clear about what objectives and for whom you're considering and what you're assuming about commitments by others. That's another problem. We can't assume that because we're doing an 80% reduction 
we are righteous and everybody else is going to copy us. We tried this in California. They've tried it in the EU. It may work. A lot of interesting work on the EU about leaders and followers and are we fools or ahead of the curve and going to get the uh, big uh, Michael Perter double dividend from that. Um, models can ensure internal consistency. I think when we find really crazy stuff in the modeling literature, it's usually somebody who has some good ideas and some good data and makes a mistake of consistency. Uh, third, uh, the results are very uncertain. Certain. That's not surprising to me because e even in projecting baselines, you have to project for multiple decades the level and composition of economic output around the world, the future of all technologies, incumbent or new technologies, um, and uh, you know, Who's going to be doing what on the policy side if you don't have, if you're not a benevolent uh, global decision, uh, decision maker? So I think it's important to think that through. When I was actually on the National Academy review of the social cost of carbon, two things about that you may not know. One is it's based on global benefits. Uh, I feel in the current um, America First environment that might not survive. Um, uh, the other thing is we actually did make a proposal for uh, essentially the U.S adopting a $42 uh, best guess with a lot of uh, uncertainty, social cost of carbon, and then what would that do to other, uh, people in other jurisdictions, which I think sounds hard, but it's probably necessary to make sense of all this. Uh, so the results can uh, d depend as much on what instruments are chosen as anything else. I already talked about that. There was a, the carbon tax uh, 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 cap and trade session was really excellent, but there was a comment at one point that lump sum recycling it's the worst thing that could be done, and it's not as good as a, uh, you know, a, a lower excess burden, you know, capital tax or capital tax labor tax trade-off. On the other hand, a lot worse things have been done with uh, government revenues that are all of a sudden available to political bodies. So, but I think we can study that, and we should. So um, I'll go through this because I'm running out of time. Uh, a little bit of what we've learned um, from this. I'll actually give the results. Um, the the um, uh, model projections can be used to assess realistic energy system, system transition rates. I'll give one or two examples of that. And then we can probably get a rough ballpark idea of what cost will be. I think three-digit precision forecasting uh, of these is very hard for all but the surest time frames. One thing we did when we started doing congressional testimony on some of this work back in uh, the late 90s was actually right after um, the second uh, uh, conference of parties, which was in uh, Geneva, was we were trying to explain uh, in non-techno-speak uh, regional uh, uh, trading of emissions rights or shifting emission right uh, uh, through time for banking and borrowing. Uh, the instrument question of how you do it might matter a lot. And, uh, it, and I won't talk about this at all, what flexibility. Uh, it's important for energy people to know that there are people now belatedly working on uh, ways to reduce the other greenhouse gases, because if, if you're only going to do a small reduction, the energy can take it all on its back. If you're going to uh, go for a deep 2 degree, 1.5 degree thing, you can't leave the other guys out. So you've got to get smart about land use ag and so on. So this is our uh, wear flexibility diagram. It just says emissions trading can be valuable enough to consider it. We have in here in uh, uh, bold, and this is actually published in the Energy Journal uh, about 1999. So the numbers have come down a little bit, but it shows with no trading between countries what the US carbon tax would need to be to hit the Kyoto target, which was 7% 7, 7 below 1990 levels by 2010. What would happen if developing countries were able to establish a trading block? And what would happen if you could let developing countries trade in respect to the uh, baseline? We didn't say any of this was hard. In fact, in the case of the last one, we said this is totally impossible for probably 20 years. But there we have it. I won't talk about the substitution of models. You know that uh, when timing really has to do with the how long the individual capital investments or infrastructure investments last. This is from our friends at E3, and it shows for various end use categories, including their assessment as the major analytic uh, uh, arm for the California government and California utilities, that if you build a new building now, you're not gonna get a chance to make a different decision for maybe 35 years or so. Um, you could probably retrofit that, but it gets harder and harder to do that. Where's an electric lighting? Uh, once your old crappy bulbs um, wear out, you can put in LED bulbs. Uh, this was uh, from a briefing to the uh, 
um, EU at the end of the pre-Paris rounds of both US and European uh, model comparison projects where we varied uh, technology cost and policy architectures. And the point of this is to show uh, to the EU uh, commissioners um, that if they backed off on the 40% reduction relative to 1990 by 2030 after doing 20 in um, 2020, um, they would lose some, uh, some face but maybe save some money, but it might be a fool's uh, game uh, because they would lose face and they wouldn't save a lot of money and they would put themselves in a bad position to get caught up later. So this simply shows, uh, based on where you go by 2030 from 2020, uh, how much more heavy lifting you would have to do in terms of decreasing energy intensity, or in this case, carbon intensity of the capital stock and how fast you would have to ramp up non-carbon technologies. This has been repeated in plenty places. This is an oldie but goodie which shows the uh, value of advanced technologies on hitting targets that then seem stringent, like 550 parts per million. And you can see as you got even modestly improved technology behind, uh, beyond the, uh, this is actually IS-92, the, the pre srs scenarios, this is a log graph. You could actually save a lot of money if the technologies on the shelf were a lot better. Uh, and then our, in our US uh, pre Paris round, uh, we actually looked at, uh, 550 and considered scenarios that had low energy intensity, no CCS allowed, no nuke, no renewable energy, low bio, emphasis on conventional and not renewables, emphasis on renewables and uh, out of bounds conventionals, namely nuclear and uh, CCS. Um, let me uh, ramp this up. So this gives the full range, the 90% range, not a probability, but a range of model outcomes for about 20 uh, different uh, global models. And then the, the uh, reference case actually had all technologies in. So this is what you lose. You'll notice an odd thing here where you're better off with low energy, inten uh, low energy intensity. And the reason for that is people shied away from putting it in our baseline. So the baseline has all the good outcomes for all the supply options and uh, kind of run of the mill for the demand side, which seemed, uh, if I could use the technical term, ass backwards to me. Uh, so here's what happens at 450, a little bit better now with the cost of renewables down, a little bit not so much better because of low gas costs. Same thing, and again, uh, a couple of distinctive things. You see the low energy intensity, high energy efficiency scenario is actually the best single solution, although hidden in the report uh, because we had a committee write the report and this was then put into the IPCC. We've kind of partially corrected that since then. And you can see the sensitivity of the results to uh, low CCS and low bio. I will admit, as I did in a parallel session yesterday, that we, in the run-up to this study and a couple of others, invented the BEX technology, the uh, biofuels with car advanced biofuels with carbon capture and sequestration, a good uh, discussion point. And uh, the technology is not there. In this work, uh, you didn't need it for about 50 years, so you had some time to do it. I, people are now wondering if it could help beat short-run tar targets in, uh, in uh, uh, the Paris Agreement. Here we have, again, similarly, and similar to some of the talks here, what happens in the reference case, a $25 a ton CO2 tax, increasing at 5% in a 50 one for 2030 and 2050 across a range of models, and you see the fight between renewables and gas that's moderately won by gas in the reference case, and as many people have shown, a uh, much better outcome in the, uh, the carbon tax cases. This is actually synced up with a revenue recycling case that had five different re revenue recycling options, and the paper on distributional impacts of that was, uh, the lead, lead was Justin Curran, who's here at HEC uh, Business School, which is pretty impressive. Uh, here we're almost to the end. Uh, here is a efficient frontier analysis from EMF 24. So this was the US uh, multi-technology, multi-policy pre-Paris round. And you'll see here, thanks to our friend uh, Alan Fawcett and others, including me at uh, EPA, this was his diagram. It basically shows aggregate uh, uh, carbon uh, emission uh, reductions for the covered emissions uh, on the horizontal axis and the cum net uh, present value of cumulative costs. Multiple cost um, metrics were considered. We use consumption loss here. You can see in the solid line a connecting line between all the efficient outcomes for different levels of carbon tax and the uh, cap and trade, the car uh, clean energy standard, which gave partial credit for gas and full credit for nuclear.
um, and a ban on uh, coal, uh, an RPS, and a no new coal, CAFE standards, and a CAFE standards, and a RPS. Interestingly, these are mostly higher, which you would expect. So efficiency is down and to the right, because you want the most bang for your buck and the lowest cost to achieve a particular level of emission reductions. However, there are some of these that are pretty close to the efficient frontier, and even a couple that go under. Before you get excited about that, that is because of a topic I didn't hear a lot about here that comes from our CGE modeling friends, and that is pre-existing taxes can create a situation in which the original frontier is not, starting point is not efficient in the first place. So you have trapezoid losses. This is Larry Goulder, Lance Bervenberger speak. You have trapezoidal um, uh, welfare losses instead of triangular ones. Uh, finally, a reality check. Uh, every year, the UN Environment Pro Program does a gap study around what people are pledging. This got easier to do, but harder to do. Uh, easier to do in terms of what the goals were, but harder to do in terms of the calculations. So this shows essentially um, what the implications are of no new policies of the uh, unconditional pledges made in Paris. And some of the pledges were conditional. If they do this, we'll do that. We'll go one better to do it. And it does show where uh, even with the uh, conditional pledges about halfway down to what looks like uh, the range of 1.5 to 2 degree C scenarios from all the models. And then this has the, uh, the gap uh, for the uh, 1.5 and the 2.0 uh, case. I will say uh, several people here have talked about cross checks on whether people are actually doing what they pledge to do. The European community through the CD Links project just finishing up now has done an amazingly complicated set of calculations based on country level studies that looks at every policy to conceivably affect greenhouse gas emissions. And that, uh, looking at that as a reality check, uh, you probably lose about half of what appears here. Now, it, it, it is true that people can, in the reconciliation phase, up their game from Paris, but it remains to be seen if they do that. This kind of transparency, I think, is a good thing. Some technical issues make it not a perfect uh, guide, but I think this is a really good way to look at uh, whether the commitments add up and uh, they do have the climate accounting and atmospheric chemistry done correctly and whether or not people are following through on their, uh, if you're going to have a voluntary agreement, it's always good to know what people are actually delivering before moving to the next level of the voluntary agreement. So again, th this is kind of the lessons learned I will put in, and I felt bad that I didn't do more on this on the sustainability uh, frame, but this is kind of a humorous way to look at this. I'll let you read that in closing. Thank you very much, John, for your brilliant presentation, and I would like now to move. Thank you for the, your brilliant presentation, and, and we'll continue the, the session with um, with uh, 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 the next uh, sp uh, invited speaker, uh, which is uh, André Plourde. Uh, André, uh, you are invited to join us at the at the panel. Uh, you, André, you you were pr president of the association in 2007. You are now professor at uh, Carleton University. And uh, we would be interested uh, to listen to your answer and your comment to the presentation, as well as where we were when you were president in uh, 2007 about uh, energy transition. Was the world known yet or not? I'm not so sure. We will see. I invite then to, to join the panel uh, P Peter Hardley. Peter Hardley, you were president more recently in 2015. And uh, you are now a professor at Rice University. Same question, uh, and uh, I invite Ricardo Rineri, uh, to, who was the president very, uh, very short time ago in 2017, uh, to his uh, professor at uh, Pontifica University Católica de Chile, uh, 
So I will start by the uh, first in chronology. So you, Andre, uh, what uh, have you learned you know, from this, um, from the message of John, uh, and uh, what are your comments on the, on the question of today, how to align uh, energy transition with climate objectives? Great, thank you, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me uh, to come here. It feels a bit awkward to be the oldest one by quite a while uh, to do this, but thank you very much uh, for, for this. <laughs> uh, so, uh, reflecting on the question of transitions when uh, in, in 12 years ago when I was president, I don't think it was an issue. I don't remember a, a discussion at any of the conferences that was focused on the notion of transitions. In those days, remember, there were a lot of deregulated markets. Electricity deregulation was a huge topic at the time, trying to figure out what's the right sort of way of thinking about electricity markets that included both kind of economics implications, but also were reasonable representations of how electricity actually works on a system. Uh, and so that was a lot of time. There were some discussions, of course, about uh, climate change and greenhouse gas emissions, and I'm not trying to be demeaning, or, or, but I think the, the issue of tr trying to think of a brave new world where essentially uh, energy uh, services would be delivered in a completely different way was not really part of the discussion at that time. That came a lot later. Uh, and so I feel that that's certainly something that has changed quite dramatically in the decade plus of the time that has occurred, and it certainly fits into the, I think, the discussions that, that John had. Much of what I'm going to say relates to uh, experience I've had a few years back working on something called the Trottier Energy Futures Project. If you actually walk around to the wall of donors, you'll find Mr. Trottier, uh, Trottier Family Foundation here, because he is based, uh, the foundation is based in Montreal, and he's here. And so the issue was to look at a way of thinking of a transition for Canada. The ultimate goal, I'm going to start, was to say, what if we tried to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions and, and CO2 equivalent, so broad bay, by 80%, and pick a time frame. 2050 was kind of the number people were throwing, throwing around. So we used a Markel type of model. I was kind of partly the check on all of this. We were a team of people. We would be brought in, you know, and see what people were doing. It was the review panel as opposed to, so please understand uh, when I speak of it in those terms. Uh, and so it was a Markel type of model, and it was done, I think, quite well. Lessons were quite interesting. First of all, we couldn't get, they couldn't get to 80% reduction. It was just not going to happen in any kind of reasonable way. And this was with, at the end, a, a, carb, a, a CO2, a price per ton of CO2 equivalent being something like $600. Canadian, yes, you can make all the bad jokes. It's what, 25 cents US? I understand. Thank you for that. But that's the kind of, of, of world that we were living in at that time. Uh, and so it was kind of a puzzle as to what was going on. And then started looking, where are the problems? And I'm going to, in the Canadian, so this is again the Canadian context. In the Canadian context, and we can argue about the numbers, but I'll, pick, I'll tell you, 20%, give or take 3% each way, of, C, of, of greenhouse gas emissions in Canada are not energy related. And so they're completely, um, well, they're not energy related in the sense that they're not energy production or consumption related. It could be methane emissions of some form or another. It could be linked to agriculture in a broader sense. It's cement and lime and all of those types of things where processes are the kind of thing, right? Realize, so kind of, okay, so first rounds, let's figure out what's the world has, what does the world have to say about this? Answer after a lot of time is we have no idea. There's very little known about how do we change the processes that create those emissions to actually reduce them. Now, go back to the original puzzle. Try to reduce Canadian greenhouse gas emissions by 80% when you can't do a darn thing. About 20% of them, there's a problem, right? And so I think, so lesson number one is that 20% you can, you know, kind of throw your hat or whatever you want, you know, it's kind of next to nothing in the big bucket. But when all of a sudden the big bucket, the remaining 80%, gets a lot smaller, the remaining 20% you're not doing anything about, in part because you don't know how to do much about it, and first, first is a problem, 
So, focus on energy, yes, much more important from a research and development side and from a modeling perspective to think about how do you represent the remaining 20%, because that's where a lot of the action is going to be. I had no idea how to do things uh, in that world. So that was a, one of the lessons that was learned in this, in this process. Matters a lot more. The, the non-energy emissions matter a lot more in a world where you're trying to cut greenhouse gas emissions and you're doing a lot of the easier quotation mark things on the carbon, the CO2 emissions that are really energy related, first thing. Uh, the second thing is, so what was the basic approach that was followed you know, into getting even to actually the highest we ever got was 70% of non of energy related emissions was kind of the top end. So if you think of this, give or take, we're talking about 55 to 60% of Canadian emissions. Good deal, but still. What was the first? Well, first thing was electrification, right? And so basically it is all about electrifying the Canadian, Canadian in this sense, uh, energy supply side, and therefore are there technologies that existed that allowed to transform how you deliver the service with electricity as opposed to uh, using it directly with oil, gas, or coal, or another uh, carbon-based uh, energy. Uh, and the answer is, okay, well, it's doable. For that, we had, you know, they had to, you know, if you think of a river somewhere, there was a dam on it. If you think of a big waterfall somewhere, there was a dam on that too. But everybody was very, un, un, very uncomfortable about this, in part because in Canada, much of this, the electricity system is already hydro-based. We'll talk about the N-word in a minute. It's already hydro-based, right? And so basically, the stuff that is high quality, near kind of consumption points already done. And so now all of a sudden you're really a long distance away in order to be generating, if you understand what I mean by that, the electricity, but now you gotta build transmission. Well, good luck with that one, right? That's not an easy project to do in and of itself. So now you're in a world, right, where you've got a lot of, the, you, if you want to electrify, in Canada, you really can't think of doing this through nuclear. You've got to do this through electricity. The big punch is going to be from large-scale hydro, given the geography of Canada. Really hard to do. Therefore, you're looking at distributed kind of wind or solar or similar types of technologies. And what we found at the time, yes, the costs are falling, still much higher. Uh, and no more easy, no easier to build. Than, than any of it. So I think part of the issue that we have to face up with in the local term is we've got offsetting for force that are opposed to one another. People want to get to a place where you've reduced greenhouse gas emissions, but systematically you can't do the actions that get you there. You can't build the transmission or the windmills, quotation marks, to get there because you create, you, you have environmental or view issues that are connected to that that really have nothing to do with greenhouse gas emissions. And so you're stuck in that world, that you really want this, but the key things to do this uh, are physically to do it are, are not very much open to you. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the difficulty in accepting policy interventions that are not involved in one way or another about governments, quotation marks, writing checks to people. It's a lot easier to write checks, a lot less efficient as a mechanism, than it is to introduce taxes or that kind of thing. Not a lot of success in Canada. Huge changes in governments in the pro in, at the provincial level, and I'm not going to think about, uh, about the, the federal level over the next while. So what's a way forward? A way forward is to think of this as an energy efficiency problem. What if it were possible to use up a lot of the, the, the space that we've got in terms of rapid or, or pretty, pretty strong improvements in energy efficiency, completely drop down the demand uh, if you think of plane, if you think of it that way, drop down the demand plane, and then all of a sudden, think of it in a purely crass term, you'd be freeing up, quotation marks, a lot of the electricity that already exists, already generated, you can then apply it to other uses. In my mind, and over the next, pick this as a, this is the way to build more generation, is actually to drop the use of the generation and re reallocate it uh, 
uh, across, uh, across uses. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Andre, for your analysis. And I, I will ask now uh, the same question to, uh, to Peter. What uh, the, the word energy transition was known in, in 2015, well, for I'm sure. Not sure. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> so, sure whether I could. But, uh, but uh, in another geography than Canada, you have also maybe some, uh, some understanding of that. So your I'm comments not sure, are welcome. I'm not sure how accurate my impression of uh, what the world was like in 2015 will be on these issues. But one thing I guess I would say is uh, I think at that time uh, there was a lot more talk about natural gas and the role of natural gas um, in, uh, in reducing the um, carbon intensity of the energy system uh, than what we hear today. Um, and the other part of your question was some reaction to some things that John had to say. And uh, I guess uh, one thing I would do is, is tie in some of his remarks with the opening uh, plenary he had in this conference, uh, where you know, there was a discussion about uh, the sort of things economists talk about, we, you know, environmental economics, we talk about uh, economic tools for handling these problems. Uh, either usually sort of cap and trade or carbon tax. Um, and, uh, you know, but a lot of the discussion we see is, is really often focused on particular technologies, say uh, renewables in this case. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, so on the one hand, you know, the, the opening uh, plenary was sort of saying that if we uh, focus on these economic tools, we, we're not really speaking to the policy makers. But I think on the other hand, it's also, I think, worthwhile us always remembering why it is economists uh, take these kinds of views that uh, we, we ought to have uh, policies that are more uh, technology neutral. You know, so there may be other ways of thinking about the energy transition. Uh, there may be other alternatives in the long run, uh, 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 alternatives to uh, carbon-based uh, energy sources. And uh, we ought to be open to those uh, rather than picking, picking particular technologies. Also to pick up a uh, a point in another plenary we had today uh, talking about storage systems. So people often just think about batteries. It came up in the discussion as the only alternative, but uh, you know, we had a very interesting presentation on, on compressed air storage, uh, a lot of discussion on hydrogen and uh, another alternative is uh, flow batteries, which weren't really raised. Uh, but you know, if we, there's a tendency sometimes to focus on the technologies, I think. You know, it's only renewables or it's only batteries. Uh, rather, whereas uh, you know, an economic uh, approach would uh, uh, leave us open to lots of alternatives, you know, the most efficient way of, of, of doing it. Uh, along those lines too, um, if we think about uh, if, uh, emissions reductions, and this came up in, in John's talk at sort of uh, negotiations between countries, how much they're going to cut back and so on. You know, if, if it, with economic uh, tools, uh, the pr principle for reductions would be you know, the equi-marginal principle basically, that you'd want to have the marginal cost of reduction to be the same in different locations around the world. But it seems to me in a lot of these discussions of this issue, uh, that is given very, very short shrift, and most of the focus is on some kind of notion of equity. What's the equitable way of, of, of uh, parceling out these reductions and so on, rather than necessarily uh, what's the efficient way? Um, uh, and the third point, I think, uh, sort of looking at this again with a hat of an economist, which I can never uh, take that hat off, I guess, <laughs> is, uh, you know, I think we ought to also emphasise as economists always the role of prices uh, in a lot of these issues. So, uh, sort of a, a, an incident that I often like to relate to people, I've told some people here um, about this. Uh, some years ago, about five years ago, I was speaking to engineers from BHP uh, Mining Company in Australia and they have iron ore mines in, uh, in northwest Australia, which is uh, one of the best places in the world for generating solar electricity. The whole electricity system in that part of the country is based on natural gas. So uh, I said to the engineers, you know, have you ever thought about uh, uh, using solar energy to generate uh, your electricity instead of using natural gas? And they looked at me and they said, what do you think we are, bloody idiots? They used the Australian vernacular. <laughs> of course we thought of you. <laughs> Of course, we thought of using solar power. So it's a very simple calculation. Uh, you look at the uh, cost of the solar plant, you look at the expected life of the solar plant, and all it's doing for you is saving on gas burn. Basically, you need the same uh, capacity, uh, electric, electric generating capacity, uh, as you would have without the solar. So you compare the discounted present value of the uh, gas, saving in gas costs with the capital cost of the plant. Do that over the life of the plant. Uh, and, uh, you know, at least at that time, they said, it's not worth it. Uh, about four or five weeks later, I visited this area, 
and in the drive from the airport uh, downtown, you look and you see almost every house has solar panels on the roof, PV panels on the roof. And of course, uh, the, um, what are those panels doing? Well, from the system-wide point of view, they're doing exactly the same thing as the BHP plant would do, but probably less efficiently, right? Because the panels are on the roof, they're probably not as high-quality panels, they're fixed angle, not necessarily optimally placed to the, to the sun. BHP probably would spend money on keeping theirs clean and so on and so forth. Uh, yet it was all worthwhile for these people to have the panels on their roof, right? So uh, it wasn't worthwhile when BHP did the calculation. It is worthwhile for the households. They're doing exactly the same thing at the system level. So why is it worthwhile for them? Well, one hypothesis is, well, they're being, getting tax subsidies and so on, but that's not very, they're not very large. But the really big factor, of course, is think about the BHP calculation. It's saying uh, we compare the capital cost to the saving in operating costs or saving in fuel costs. But for the household, they're comparing the capital cost of the panel to the saving in the electricity charge. The electricity charge doesn't just represent marginal co fuel costs, it represents fixed costs because the way we, way we charge for electricity, we load the fixed costs into a per kilowatt hour taken charge so they're telling, the prices are telling them that when they put panels on their roof, they're saving on a bunch of fixed costs in the system, which they aren't, right? So, uh, so you have um, sort of, a, so the prices, we, we don't get the prices right, they're not sending the right kind of signal, you can have a uh, very mistaken calculation made, and that can have uh, lots of efficiency consequences. So I think as economists, we've got to think about um, uh, that kind of issue as well. The final point I would make um, that uh, climate policy and energy transition, uh, another way of, of uh, handling climate issues uh, is that we can think about uh, adaptation, right? So you mentioned this, uh, thinking about, I just went through the, the, the Hurricane Harvey in Houston and so on. Um, in that sense, it's nothing really to do necessarily with energy transition, right? And, it, and one thing that strikes me about a lot of these discussions of climate policy is that there's, it seems to me there's often a lot of fairly low-hanging fruit, really, in terms of uh, adaptation expen uh, expenditures, and it's hardly ever discussed. And um, I, I raised this question, there was an IAE conference some years ago, Richard Toll was one of the speakers, and um, talking about climate, and I asked him the question in Q&A, you know, uh, about adaptation uh, expenditure, and wouldn't that, a lot of that have uh, very high benefit cost ratios relative to a lot of other things we're talking about. And his answer to me was, well, when people are discussing these things, uh, climate policy, the assumption is made <laughs> that all cost-effective, adaptive uh, measures have been taken. Uh, well, I can tell you for sure, looking at what happened in Houston, that all cost-effective adaptation <laughs> measures have not been taken. <laughs> and if you think about uh, uh, some of the things that you would do to uh, reduce the cost of um, high rainfall in Houston, I mean... It's, it's going, they're going to protect you against all sorts of uh, uh, climate, let's shall we say climate change, no matter what the source. Uh, and so you should factor that in in the benefit cost ratio. Uh, so they're just a few thoughts, uh, thinking about these kinds of things from the point of view of an economist. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. So uh, two years after, uh, two years after the Paris Agreement, you became president, and you, uh, so you, maybe you have some uh, vision of uh, how the world energy transition moved from two years over time. Is it still full of meaning or less, uh, less, with, less with le less uncertainty, more uncertainties? And uh, are we on the track uh, on the climate change objective? So uh, what is your view, uh, Ricardo? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, I was at that. The energy industry have changed a lot. Huh? Uh, as uh, John already mentioned, we have, I think, a, a big uh, public good problem uh, at the international level, uh, how we can agree, we can coordinate in, in reaching an agreement that uh, really provides uh, enough in terms of uh, measures to uh, reach that uh, two degrees Celsius uh, objective. And it appears that we are not doing enough. Uh, there is a great concern that we are not doing enough. Uh, the Paris Agreement, I, I think, was a, a good signal, uh, but it's a not mandatory agreement, so the countries will do their best effort uh, to, to comply with that. 
but certainly we are far away of uh, what uh, might be needed to uh, reach uh, a two degrees Celsius as a maximum in terms of uh, temperature change. Uh, I will take uh, one of the points that uh, was mentioned by John uh, regarding institutional barriers, communication, and uncertainty in terms of long-term effects. And we are economists, uh, and was mentioned uh, at the beginning of the conference, uh, the importance that we have to do what we do as best as we can in terms of uh, evaluating uh, cost, benefits, uh, efficiencies, uh, uh, and that is what we do the best. But I think uh, if we want to uh, reach to the uh, political community, we have to be able to communicate uh, in the right way with them. Uh, the political times are very different to what are our times in, in science or in economics. Uh, uh, political people want uh, issues to be solved right away with low cost that are very popular to the people. Uh, uh, so there is a big challenge uh, uh, for us in terms of uh, choosing the right tools uh, uh, in terms of uh, what can be done and what cannot be done in terms of uh, policy measures when you are in the political uh, arena. Uh, in general, uh, if you are in the political arena, they will see us very far away. Uh, these guys, uh, yes, I understand their, their points, but uh, they certainly don't understand the points of a person that is in policy making issues. So I think that is, is a barrier that we have to uh, face. We have to work on that and how we can uh, communicate in a better way and how we take into account uh, those institutional barriers, those political barriers in our proposals uh, because they, they exist and they are uh, real. Hmm? Uh, I think that uh, in terms of the policies, certainly we should look to promote efficiency. Uh, I think uh, is, uh, we, we are very effective uh, uh, in terms of choosing what are the best tools for, for certain problem if we have the right uh, information and we cannot uh, lose that uh, track in terms of, of what uh, we are doing. And uh, in looking the way forward, well, we are far away of what we need, uh, but uh, we are facing a world with increasing constraints of on CO2 emissions. Uh, we have uh, younger generations are much more aware of this issue, uh, and we have seen some important movements that are taking place uh, in terms of uh, locally, globally. Uh, and we are seeing a very active role of the civil society. Uh, and in that respect, uh, what are the best policies I think that uh, we can take? Well, we have to take advantage of uh, new technologies. I think the technology improvement has been quite success in terms of doing a shift in the energy mix. We are far away. We still have about 85% of uh, our energy that comes from fossil fuels. Uh, fossil fuel by itself is nothing wrong with that. The problem is CO2 emissions. Uh, uh, so uh, technology, I think, is, is, is something that is key, and everything that can be done in terms of improving technology, improving energy efficiency, uh, is something that is uh, very uh, worth, and uh, we should keep working on that. Uh, on terms of uh, the energy mix, I think uh, when I look what is going on in the power sector, for example, and was already uh, mentioned by Peter, in the issue of battery storage. Um, uh, we are seeing increasing percentage of uh, intermittency uh, renewable uh, energy sources in electricity mix. And uh, in, general, in the case of Chile, for example, the studies that have been done uh, show that uh, the system will be able to manage about 30% as at a maximum of uh, uh, solar and wind in the, in the matrix. Today, we are in 20%, so without further improvements in, in technology and storage systems, uh, we will not be able to incorporate larger amounts of 
uh, renewable intermittency, renew renewable energy in the electricity mix. So I think uh, technology is something that to be put, to be improved, and uh, there are big challenges still on, on, on that way. So uh, I think uh, we are on the right track, but very far away uh, with what uh, we need to be uh, to, the, to be done with this. Thank you very much, Ricardo. So we, we have time for 10 minutes question. If uh, you are interested in raising some questions, there are two microphones over here. And uh, if not, I have one. Uh, I, this morning we had, uh, during uh, Christian de Pertuis, uh, uh, co-plenary co session, uh, a speech of Yann Perry, which uh, was uh, granted uh, very, very, uh, the award uh, last night on, uh, of the IAEA. Uh, he, he discussed about uh, the acceptance of uh, carbon pricing, and we in France, we are exper experimented that a little bit uh, on uh, every Saturday morning. And, and, uh, the question is, in addition to the th our series and the, the best strategies to, 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 to reach the, uh, the climate change uh, 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 fight, um, how to make it more acceptable, how to, how to uh, uh, he, he, he said, for instance, we have to, um, to uh, involve the stakeholders, uh, they have to be committed, uh, we have to uh, assist the low-income low, low, low people, uh, we have to um, communicate on the, on the reason why uh, the, the strategies are implemented. Uh, do, do, do you think uh, we, are, we are missing something or something should be done? To, 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 uh, to prepare the opinion to making some effort to uh, accept the, the carbon price. So the, the question is addressed to the panel. <laughs> so I think people would, um, I'll tie a few things together. I think people in general who come back to the low income people um, might be willing to accept a tax if they were sure it was going to be low. Mm. So I actually wrote in, at the time of the Kyoto Protocol, it was a waste of time to do targets and timetable. You wanted to invest in advanced energy technology at that point just to get the, the difference down. Mm. But I think we're not too far away from mm. an acceptable price. Uh, and I, I tried to follow Ian's logic. It was actually a very nice uh, 135 country uh, simple model, which is a good way to compare marginal, marginal cost, as several of the panelists uh, said. So how, do you get the so how do you get the price lower, advanced technology, and a lot of energy efficiency? As you said, not only do you not have to site big facilities and transmission lines, but you have much less further to go, and therefore the tax will be lower. Yeah. But um, the one thing I couldn't completely understand, I think what Ian was saying is for the low-income people who might feel the most most put off by it, you could just simply take the revenues and recycle it to them in a way that didn't reward them for hmm. continuing. Is that the way you understood yeah, 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 it? Yeah, it's the way I understood it. Um, and that's not a bad idea. I, I didn't get a chance to talk about our uh, MF32 study, which hmm. was just published last hmm. year in Climate Change Economic, that Justin hmm. uh, Karen did the equity piece, but we did uh, you know, a, a thing that was actually, believe it or not, proposed by uh, senatorial staffs in the U.S., and that was to take 20% of the revenues and give it all to the lowest 20% of the income distribution, thereby making them probably better off than initial, and then doing the usual capital versus labor tax political thing between the, uh, you know, what we used to call uh, liberals and uh, conservatives. And that actually had some legs. I'm not sure where that is now, but uh, particularly on the lower end, that might be a way forward as you get the lower income people going towards efficiency in economic terms and um, um, not feeling an uh, undue burden. In fact, perhaps being rewarded a little bit. And the, the one thing I'll say about that is it is unfortunate that there wasn't enough, uh, uh, hasn't been, I think, enough data to do that more generally, but I think, uh, as he showed hmm. very artfully, that we're gaining on that thing. And I think, obviously, looking at the way the world politic has moved, 
uh, being more aware of the distributional consequences. And it's actually, in Justin's paper, it was not only income distribution, but regional uh, distributions in, uh, by industry and so on. And those are sometimes correlated with income distribution and sometimes not, which is an interesting thing. But I think we're moving in a way that's um, going to enable people to do more of that, and I think we need to do more of that. It was a little bit frustrating back 20 years ago that often the response from the economist when asked about equity is, oh, we're not in charge of uh, deciding what an equitable outcome, and we ha have the ability to do the but, but we have the ability to do uh, distributional impacts. And then usually the snide uh, blowback on that, but when's the last time you ever actually ever did that? So I think it should be more, I, I guess Joe Stiglitz has a book now that says something like that is until we get that problem solved, it's gonna be tough sledding in the international mm -hmm. political environment we now have. Thank you. André, you want to add something? Yeah, quickly, I think on, on, on the equity issue, I think we tend to confuse price problems with income problems. Poor people are poor because they don't have enough income. And so I think to, to confuse the two issues, I think, is not helpful in the debate. So if we feel that that's a problem, it's not an issue not to act on the price front. It's an issue to recycle if necessary and to deal with the income issue in a different sort of way. These are separable problem. They don't have enough income now. It's not just the change in, uh, in energy prices that would, uh, that would create uh, a problem on that front. So I feel there's a danger in confusing the two. On, on the political side, what's particularly, on the one hand, it is, uh, we've done a lot of difficult things on a political side. You know, we've banned smoking in public places. I mean, this was not, you know, those of old, old like me, you remember that. Uh, this was not an easy thing to do, and we did it. Is the issue now that there's not agreement across the political spectrum on either the problem or on dealing with the problem? And so they're getting, the, the, the voters are getting very different messages from people that they, that they see as equally responsible. People are not out there, the politicians, and I don't think that's the perception, are out there to destroy the world, right? And so you get people that you think are in both equally credible as representing in some way or another the public will, if you think of it that way, telling you completely different stories. No wonder they don't accept one thing because somebody's telling them this is not a problem and somebody's telling them even if it is a problem, it's the wrong way to deal with it. So I think there's a messaging type of problem uh, that we've not... Uh, had before. So I think dealing with that is going to be a problem. The next last thing, and I'm sorry I'm taking so long, is one of the sessions today somebody was saying, well, you know, maybe as economists we kind of should give up on prices and, 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 uh, and cap and trade and go to, and I'll use the word, to, to second best solutions. And I'm sitting there thinking, actually, we're probably thinking to go to like 30 second best solutions, more than second best solutions, mm -hmm. it's a problem. Where I don't know, and where we've not, I think, maybe we've not done as good a job is to show what's the consequences, what's, what is the cost consequences of going from first best, if we believe in that, to 30 second best, not to second best. I don't know that we've articulated that argument as economists particularly well. Thanks. I'll give you, <clears throat> just have one brief comment, which is, uh, I'll give you some empirical evidence on what might, what might make a carbon tax acceptable to conservative, or somewhat conservative, I guess, which is, uh, you know, the, chair, the, the uh, chairman of the Baker Institute, James A. Baker the Third Institute is, of course, James Baker, <laughs> and uh, he's been proposing uh, with other uh, prominent Republicans and so on a, a carbon tax and he's given various talks on it at the Institute at Rice University. And uh, I can tell you that from his point of view, uh, the number one uh, feature that, uh, or number one uh, as aspect of, po of the policy package that would make a carbon tax acceptable to him and his group is that you've got to, it's got to be uh, combined with uh, d uh, 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 taking away all of these other kinds of interventions, regulatory interventions and, and uh, you know, specifying specific technology to be used and so forth. So for him, there's a, the real trade-off is, uh, you know, a, a cleaner CO2 tax yes. 
but you get rid of all of these other uh, uh, much more detailed and distorting mm -hmm. and so on interventions. Okay. I think it's a very, very complex issue, a carbon tax. I just remind that you have been a uh, minister, and so you have maybe met people in the street sometime uh, because of the price of energy. Okay. Uh, very complex issue. Uh, if we ask consumers, young people, they will say yes, well, let's put a carbon tax. Uh, but when we tell them, well it, go, well, it will go in your utility bill or in your uh, gasoline bill, they will think, think it again. So I think it's a very complex issue. On the side of the companies, uh, business side, some companies may like a carbon tax in terms that it provides some uncertainty in terms of uh, their activity. However, however, uh, once you put the tax, let's start with the tax of ten, fifty dollars uh, per ton CO2. They get nervous because, well, it was ten, fifty. Why not next? It goes to thirty, forty, and fifty. Yeah? <laughs> And in Chile, we start with a carbon tax of $5, uh, and that is what is paid by power generators. Uh, uh, but, but there is also a carbon tax to assist social projects, so government projects that involve uh, CO2 emission. There is also a price for CO2 emission that is about $30, $40 per ton of CO2. So the industry is always looking at that other number. They say, well, at some moment they will apply that number to us. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's a very uh, complex issue going into uh, a carbon tax. Uh, uh, and that's why uh, in Chile we also discussed it for a long time uh, a cap and trade mechanism. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I would like uh, you to join me to thank all the speakers for this uh, brilliant session. <laughs> And now we, it's time to close the, this session, and uh, I would like to thank uh, Pierre-Olivier Pinault for organizing this uh, brilliant, wonderful event. Thank you very much, Pierre-Olivier.